Bonjour à toutes et tous. En premier lieu, un petit mot pour les anglophones. Hello everybody. If you want to follow the conversation in English, I invite you to choose the English channel on the bottom of your screen by clicking on the button that looks like a globe. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous. Hello everybody. As I was saying, my name is Clara Labori. I'm a PhD student at the University of Grenoble Alp and I'm the lucky person to be moderating this event today. There are many of you here with us today and we'd like to thank you for being present with us and for your interest in doing a PhD degree in France and especially at the University of Grenoble Alp. Now, just a few instructions so that everything goes as well as possible. Can I ask you to keep your microphones and cameras switched off throughout the event? But you can ask your questions directly using the chat function. We will hear about your questions and we will try and answer them as best as possible. The event has three parts. We will have a round table discussion on PhD degrees, generally speaking, and then a more specific round table on a more specific kind of PhD, an international PhD or an industrial research PhD. These will be interesting for you because there are a lot of international students listening to us today, so I'm sure you'll be particularly interested in the second round table. You will also have the possibility to join one of the doctoral schools present today to talk with the management team of the doctoral school. Now, at the university here in Grenoble and Alp, the PhD degree is promoted by the doctoral college. And it's Denis Youngman, the director of the college, who is here to introduce the forum. Hello, Denis. Hello. So you are the director of the doctoral college. You are a professor at the University of Grenoble Alp. You teach in the Polytech Engineering School and you do your research at the Earth Sciences Institute. So the first question is, can you tell us a few words about the doctoral college and how it works? So this is the cross-cutting component of the university. It promotes the doctoral policy of the university. And so it brings together 13 doctoral schools that make up, that cover all of the scientific fields. So it's these uh, doctoral schools that the students will be finding out more about later on in the third part of the session. So you'll be able to sign up to one of the doctoral school uh, rooms. Thank you. So what does a PhD degree represent at the University of Grenoble Alp? Well, we're talking about 3,000 PhD students, half of whom are from abroad. So we have 50% of international students. So that's quite a high number, and it does reflect how scientifically dynamic the site here in Grenoble is when it comes to scientific research. These PhD students contribute to the dynamism and the reputation of the university because it's very well ranked nationally and internationally. So this quality, the quality of the research can is, is very visible here in Grenoble. So a PhD degree is a passport. It's the highest possible diploma. So it's a passport for, for a, a professional career, nationally or internationally, in a, the private or public sector. Our employability rate is over 90%. Would you like to say a last few words to the students listening to us today? Yes, perhaps a few words in particular, because unlike a bachelor's or a master's degree, a PhD degree is the first professional experience. A PhD student uh, is a young researcher and therefore is part of a research environment, part of a research lab. And it's this word research that is the key word. Um, all PhD students take part in this research. And given the current environment, the current situation, we're facing some major challenges when it comes to, you know, different transitions, the climate transition, the environmental transition, the democratic transition. And I think that PhD students have a very important role to play here, thanks to their scientific analysis, thanks to the proposals that they can make for the future. So, from that point of view, you know, it's very important that you uh, register for a PhD degree if you're interested in one. Thank you very much, Denis. See you very soon. So, we can start the first round table now. Et donc, nous allons... 
so here we are. We can start the first roundtable discussion, the overview of the PhD degree. The objective is to explain what a PhD degree is, why do one, and how do you do one. So you will see this straight away. Doctoral studies are quite different from what you are familiar with. And to explain what a PhD degree is all about, well, I have four speakers with me and they will help you to understand what a PhD degree is. So we have Nadine Massa. Hello, Nadine. Hello. Thank you for being with us. You're Deputy Director for the Doctoral School in charge of tuition, art, literature, languages and human and social sciences. And you're a professor at the university. You teach at the economics faculty in Grenoble and you work for the Gale Lab as a researcher. Can you say, tell us a few words about the purpose of your research with the microphone, please? Yes, of course. Yes. So I'm a researcher at the Gale Lab. It specializes in economics. It focuses on innovation and consumer, sustainable consumer behavior. And I'm a specialized in the economics of innovation and especially the analysis and assessment of public policies in favor of innovation and research and development. Thank you very much. Just next to you, we have Fabrice Emerio. Hello, Fabrice. Hello, you're the deputy director of the doctoral school in charge of tuition, but this time in science, technology and health. You're a professor at the university in Grenoble at the INP ENC Cubed and you're a researcher at the 3S Art Lab. Can you tell us a few words about the purpose of your research? Well, my research, it's all about civil engineering, uh, geotechnical structures uh, that we all encounter in our life. So tunnels, roads, uh, railways, dams, any kind of uh, question that I look at in my research uh, is linked to uh, these kinds of structures and the problems uh, relating to sustainable development as well. Thank you. We also have with us Christelle Breton. Hello. So you are in charge of the doctoral school, in charge of training and professional integration. You're a professor at the university as well, and you teach at UFR for chemistry and biology, and you are a researcher at the SOMA. Would you like to say a few words? Um, I can't hear her very well. That's better. So I focus on glycosciences at a multidisciplinary study, so the sugar generally speaking. So I'm a glycobiologist, therefore, that's the way I like to define what I do. I focus on proteins that make all of our sugars that are hidden, that we find at the surface of our cells and provide us with very important messages. And I try and decipher these messages to understand um, their role in human uh, pathologies. Thank you. And then we have the we're lucky to have Fadi Kelada with us, who is a PhD student. So I met up with Fadi during training. You're Egyptian. You're in your second year in the doctoral school for um, electronics, electrical energy, automatic control and signal processing. And you're doing your research in the electrical engineering uh, lab. Perhaps you could tell us about your research. Yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Yes, I'm preparing my thesis. I'm in my second year and I'm preparing my thesis in the uh, G, uh, to, to E lab and I focus on the theme of stability and control of electrical networks. And I look at renewables, especially wind, uh, power, batteries, etc. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. So let's start our first uh, session of questions with Fabrice, because Fabrice, uh, above all, it's important to understand what a PhD degree is and how long it lasts. Well, to answer that question, can I just remind you what Duny already said? A PhD degree is the highest possible university diploma that you can have in France. It's perhaps the highest possible diploma that's recognized internationally everywhere in the world. Everybody knows what a PhD is. It's more difficult to know what master's and bachelor's degrees um, are. So a PhD degree is a research project. 
It lasts, let's say, three years. It, but if uh, it's full time, but it might be longer if it's part time. The main objective is to contribute to the development of scientific and technological knowledge in one or other of the fields represented in the doctoral schools. It's also a project that is carried out by a PhD student. It's a research subject. It's about having a research supervisor. It's about having a lab or a company that you work with. And as Denise said, a thesis is a first professional ex experience. It's, it's rather specific because a PhD student is also a student, but is also employed. They are part of a structure and they have to follow the operating rules of the structure, whether it's a lab or a company. And it's all about having a real project. It's about managing that project, uh, following an objective, having a methodology, having the right kind of schedule, having deliverables. So it's all about project management. And this means that what's developed over the course of the PhD um, are scientific skills in specific discipline. But it's also about developing broader skills project management skills, for example, uh, finding means of financial, technical, human resources. It's all about learning about communication. And it's a period over the course of which uh, the PhD student can embark on other activities, teaching, for example, that uh, can contribute to their skills development. And these skills are professional skills that are recognized and that will be recognized in the uh, future career of the young doctor, whether the doctor works in research in the world of academia or in the public or private sector or another kind of structure. Thank you very much, Fabrice. Nadine, perhaps you could just uh, specify what the status of a PhD student is. Yes, now the status of a PhD student, well, it's... I'm going to reflect what um, Fabrice has already said. It, a PhD student is somebody who is very motivated by a specific subject, who is very inquisitive as well. It's somebody who likes to uh, explore things, to dig deep into things, uh, into a subject that uh, the, the student wishes to know more about. It's about managing of the project. It's, it's also somebody who's a researcher in a lab. And these different things might uh, vary according to the status. If the PhD student has specific financing, for example, for the research, or whether this, the, the PhD student has a, 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 is employed in a company, the objectives may be academic, or, or not as academic. It really depends whether the researcher has found other types of financing, maybe a project with a company, or working on a subject that's financed. So in that case, the PhD student will be employed and will work on a specific profession that they may follow after the PhD. And, um, or maybe the student started an internship as part of a master's and, and wants to dig into things deeper. And that's uh, the case in a certain number of cases. And, uh, you know, it's uh, other employees are in companies and, and they might do their PhD as part of further education. So, and their objective may be slightly different. Their status might be slightly different. If they're, you know, pursuing their career, uh, they're wanting to move up in their career. So uh, they're not conventional researchers with an academic project in that case. Thank you very much, Nadine. Let me now turn to Christelle. Why do a thesis? What reasons should lead you to do a PhD degree? And what does that help with? Well, that's a great question. Um, a lot has already been covered in by the previous speakers. So you're in a you're in a master's degree or you've got an engineering school degree. You might wonder whether you want to do a PhD, or you might wonder whether you should stop there. 
I know I, I, I caught the virus when I did my master's internship, when I went to a research lab to work. That's really what creates the desire to continue normally. But, you know, three extra years, sometimes it's quite frightening. You wonder whether you have the right level of motivation, whether you really want to be a researcher. In fact, a PhD degree uh, leads to many more professions than you might believe. If you want to be a researcher and a teacher, then quite simply that opens up much broader prospects and opportunities. So as Denis said and as Fabrice repeated, it's all about having a professional experience. You, you focus on a project, you carry out that project, you manage that project, and on, often that project um, has meaning. Research is all about um, answering questions for society, for the planet, and for a whole a range of different things. And it's about taking part in an adventure. In my discipline, it's all about collaboration as well. It's very collaborative. You can do this, you can collaborate with your team, but you can also collaborate with other teams, national teams, international teams, etc. So it's training that really does bring with it a lot of skills, skills that you can use outside of the academic or research world. And we'll talk about that a bit later on when we talk about careers. But these skills are very much um, in demand. So we have a PhD student with us who is in the middle of their PhD. Can I ask you the question, Fadi, why did you want to start a PhD degree? Well, as Christelle said, she caught the virus when she did her master's internship. It was the same for me. I never thought I'd do a PhD degree, but after my internship, it, it wasn't in a lab, it was in a company, but the company did an awful lot of research. And I wanted to do a lot of research on simulation tools and things like that. So I thought to myself, I feel quite comfortable with this research methodology. And, and I, I discovered I had a real passion for research. And, and so I, I was very much motivated to continue uh, on for another three years, to continue on with that adventure, as, as, as she said. So there's that research opportunity then that really pushed me into this research environment. I thought I'd really like to continue with research. And, and you know, if that's the case for other people, then, you know, you need to be motivated. You need uh, to see what the advantage of doing research is as well. So I'm in the middle of my PhD, and I think that research <laughs> comes with disappointments, not just success. So it's very important to keep that in mind. You know, every day when you wake up, you want you need to be motivated to continue. Every day. That's what it's all about. You have to have that motivation. If you don't have that motivation, if you don't have that vocation, let's say, then you will find it difficult to continue to with your PhD. Yes, I think we can all agree with that. Yes, yes, you've got to learn to manage failure indeed. Now, let's not stay with that idea of a failure. Let's talk about career prospects. There are many of these. Can you maybe summarize some of them, Christelle? Yes, um, career prospects. Well, research professions, uh, higher education professions. Then you have research in the private sector that is possible. And there are a certain number of doctors who've created their own activity, their own businesses, or they've taken other activities or companies, or they can act as consultants. They may have important functions, administrative roles, for example. In fact, there are many fields possible. Because the skills that you develop when you're doing your PhD, and, and of course PhD students have to try and understand what those skills are, it's important to make an effort 
So there are scientific, technical skills that are developed, but there are also project management skills that are developed, communication skills, the ability to write, the ability to ask the right questions and to have an international view of a specific subject. All of these are very important skills and they're skills that can be moneyed in the professional world. Let me just cite one. Angela Merkel, the former German chancellor, she had a PhD in quantum physics. So you see, um, there are different possibilities. There are other personalities, very public personalities, uh, sports people, uh, people working in culture, who also did a PhD, but then decided to uh, branch off into other fields. So PhD training is very, so there's, there's a, a lot of training and, and it is worth a lot as well. So we now understand what a PhD degree is and all the career possibilities that are open thanks to it. Now let's try and understand how you apply to do a PhD and concretely what happens during the training period. So let me turn back to Fabrice. Can you explain to us what the prerequisites are for starting a PhD degree? Well, the first thing that uh, needs to be pointed out is that, uh, uh, you know, when you think of the usual training uh, that uh, PhD students have been through, it's a master's degree, a university master's degree or an engineering degree, which is the equivalent. So both of these courses are recognized if you want to do a PhD. For foreign students, there are other training courses that exist, perhaps linked more. Well, the Master of Science is something that we're often quite interested in. But, you know, you have to have the right equivalents when you apply. You've got to have your diploma validated by the university. It has to be an equivalent to a master's degree. So that's the first thing you need to know. Then, of course, you need to be able to put forward a thesis project. So it's not just, you know, having being an applicant. You've got to have a subject and you've got to have a, a supervisor and you've got to have a school that you're interested in. You're talking about uh, international diploma equivalences. Um, Fadi, tell us about you. Did you have to do extra training when you arrived in France? Yes. I did most of my studies in Egypt. I had an engineering uh, degree and the Egyptian education system is more like the English education system. Um, an engineering degree is five years after A-levels. So it's not the equivalent of a master's degree or and it's not the equivalent of an engineering school degree in France. It's not the equivalent of a master's degree. So it's more like a bachelor's, uh, an engineering bachelor's degree. So I had to do some additional training. I had to do an, an additional year of a master's degree so that I had the equivalent. And that's what I did. I came here in France in 2020. I had a French government subsidy, a grant from the French government, and I was able uh, to obtain this. There was an international master's program focusing on electrical engineering and the theme of intelligent networks in buildings. And so that's how I got in. I obtained my master's degree. And so that's how I was able to apply for a, to do a thesis in France. Now, here's an obvious question that follows on from that. How do you find your subject, the subject for your thesis? Nadine, can you give us some ideas? What you have to understand is that when you apply to do a PhD, it's not like applying to do a bachelor's or a master's degree. It's much more like, uh, you know, applying for a job. In other words, you have to 
work on your network. You have to find out as much as you can when you're in your master's degree to see what subjects are around, what, what is being offered because often there are thesis subjects that are put forward by doctoral schools or offered by other organizations that are part of a network. So you try and demonstrate that you're the right person for the subject. So it's all about preparation. And it's the same when you're applying for a job. You use your network, you use uh, your contacts that, that uh, teachers that you may have come across, laboratory staff uh, in the laboratory where you might have done your internship. So it's very important to do internships. So, so you can have subjects with financing and uh, in other cases, you might not necessarily have an answer to a call for tender. So in that case, you have your own idea for a, your own subject, something that you're really interested in. And in that case, you've got to look for a lab or when you're, when you're doing your master's degree, you've got to look for the right person who will want to work with you as part of a PhD. You've got to look for the lab and a supervisor. You've got to find a supervisor and you've got to set up a relationship with that person. Uh, you've got to show that you're ready to commit to a long-term project on uh, a subject. So once you've found your thesis supervisor and your lab, what do you have to do then? quickly, briefly, what are, the, what are the sources of financing that exist as well uh, so that you can be paid while you're doing your PhD? Well, there are, there's a vast amount of possibilities, in fact. You might, uh, for example, get public financing, 100% public financing. So um, there are research subsidies provided by the state, for example, or, or managed by doctoral schools, or by the doctoral college and by the doctoral schools. So that's the first source of financing. And it says, and Nadine was saying, you know, there is a lot of competition. Uh, it's like applying for a job. Uh, so you've got to be good at it. And then there is other financing that can be obtained. Uh, by labs, uh, after there may be calls for projects. You've got, the, uh, for example, the National Research Agency, the ADEM agency in France that may provide financing for theses. And then there are theses that might be financed by companies, uh, either directly. Uh, we, were, we were talking about a, a financing mode involving companies and a state contribution earlier on. So you can have a mixed kind of financing, or you can have theses that are financed 100% by a company. You can have financing that can come from foreign lands, grants that might be that might bring together France and a foreign country. So there's a, a broad range of possibilities. You also have European financing projects. So for European projects, it's all, it's quite specific because when you're part of a European project, you can't recruit a purely French master's student, but you can send your best master's students over, over to another organization, a foreign organization. So that's, there's, there are some interesting international master's students who uh, cover different sites, who work on different sites. And so for somebody who wants to do an international thesis, that's something that they could uh, look into. There are many possibilities from that point of view. Christelle, once we're, we've applied for our thesis, we've got our financing, we've got our supervisors, we've got everything, we've got the lab and everything, you know, what happens? How do you, you know, how are you trained over the course of your three, four, five years? Well, that's the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with your supervisor or supervisors. You might have one or two thesis supervisors, especially when you're working on multidisciplinary subjects, uh, which uh, gives you an asset for your CV. So it's about acquiring knowledge, it's about buying into the subject, about 
be, becoming more and more autonomous to begin with. Of course, you need more supervision, but little by little, you need to be able to demonstrate that you can be independent and autonomous. So there's the experimental work, there's those, there are the studies that you do over the course of the PhD. And I tend to say that towards the end, you should be the world specialist, one of the best world specialists on the subject that you worked on as part of your PhD. Now, at the same time, the doctoral college also uh, one likes to accompany you, it likes to provide you with support. Um, and what do I mean by this? It means that the college will give you the possibility to follow training that is not just based on the discipline or based on a specific thing. That training can be training in languages, uh, ethics, research and scientific integrity, everybody has to follow that course uh, and we advise students to do it in their first year. There are also courses that are linked to entrepreneurship or major societal challenges. So we've got a range of training courses so that uh, students can broaden their scientific culture. It's also important today for entrepreneurs and, and companies, generally speaking, when they're taking on PhD students to make sure that they are used to using the advanced tools. So there is a whole range of tools that, and things that we can offer. And, and we oblige, and it's for their good, we oblige PhD students, it's not to annoy them, we oblige them to follow 120 hours of training, about 80 hours in the acquisition of soft skills, so cross-cutting skills or training uh, for their career. Because when you're too um, uh, preoccupied with your only subject, with your PhD subject, you don't know how to think about your professional project. You you forget about that. So in the doctoral college, there is you know it's important to look at career plans. There are workshops that are organized so that people can think about their skills, think about their professional project. Not everybody's going to end up as a researcher or a researcher and teacher. So you have to ask the right questions, not, um, you know, if you decide that you don't want to continue with research, um, you need to be able to move on to something else, envisage something else. So the doctoral college is there to help you from A to Z. So support is provided and that support is obligatory and it's provided by the doctoral schools every year for example when you reapply for your second or third year there is a, an individual monitoring committee that gets together and and we take stock of your situation we talk to your supervisors we talk to you we look at whereabouts you are we check that everything is going okay we check that there have been no relational problems for example so, what is a PhD then? Well, it's about having support from your lab and support from the doctoral school and the doctoral college. So, you're never just on your own out there. Thank you, Christelle. So, as well as the question of training, to close this session, we need to talk about teaching possibilities. When you're a PhD student, even if you're only doing a few hours or, or you can actually do up to 60 hours a year. So this is something that can help uh, doctoral students think about their future. Maybe they want to do teaching in the future, but it also gives them an additional skill. So in the minutes remaining, let's move on to questions from the public. So we've only got a few minutes left. Can I ask you to be quite brief uh, with your question? So what mark do you have to have in your master's to hope to go on to do a PhD degree? What mark should you have? Nadi? Well, others will add. These questions are defined by the doctoral schools. So some doctoral schools, not all doctoral schools, impose a specific minimum mark of 14, 14 out of 20, that is. And they have to have, and they impose other disciplines. Others don't impose a mark, but generally speaking, a minimum of 12 is required, 12 out of 20. If it's below 12, 
then the potential applicants will have to work hard on their dossier, on their application. Uh, in terms of marks, that's what I can say. But all, all applications are looked at comprehensively. And if there is the motivation, and if uh, there is a, a good mark for a master's dissipation, um, and there are uh, good testimonials, for example, um, then that, that's all in the student's favor. But if the dissertation mark is not very good, then maybe the student needs to wonder whether they are able to do uh, the research work required by a PhD. Yes, I can add to what um, Nadine has said. So when it comes to science and technology and health, now, generally speaking, there, there is no minimum mark required by our doctoral school, but the, a doctoral school director will look at the marks when students are applying, especially those having done French masters, but masters generally speaking as well. They'll look at the academic semesters and they'll look at the research internship. There's no general rule though. But, you know, the better the marks, obviously, the, the greater the chances of being able to do a PhD degree are. So what is the percentage of PhD students who do their theses in the three-year period? I can answer that. Very few, in fact, the three in the 36 months from start to the defense of the thesis, it's more like about 40 months for most PhD students in France. It's more 40 months. So it's 36 months, the three years plus a few extra months to finalize the thesis, the written thesis, uh, to, um, and, and define uh, the, the, the date for the defense. Let's take one last question. What about access to the professional world? Is it complicated? Um, yes and no. What I mean by that is that we've always tried to organize meetings, encounters according to discipline, according to sector, with PhD students. And companies are ready. They're ready to come and take part in these events. But the PhD students in their labs don't always see what the advantage is. And we're often disappointed because there is a very low rate of participation at these events, these meetings. You can carry out assignments in companies, and we do encourage uh, PhD students to do this. You talked about teaching, for example. Yes, uh, people uh, can uh, do assignments in companies. Often it's difficult. Uh, for them uh, because there's the duration of the thesis. Three, three years, it, uh, yes, three years is not very long uh, for doing a thesis. So you don't always have time to go and uh, do things elsewhere. So there are lots of European projects, as I was saying, and now you have to have work in companies. You have to do internships, one month, two month internships in these companies. And increasingly, we, we en encourage students to do this. We're, we're, we're trying to bring together the industrial world with the world of research. Okay, thank you for this first uh, session. We're now going to move on to the second round table. But first of all, I'd like to thank all of my speakers, Nadine, Fabrice, Christelle, and of course, Fadi, for being present and uh, for giving us such top quality information. We're going to have a break now, just a few minutes, the time it takes for the round table to be set up. But while we're getting set up, have a look at this video on the University of Grenoble Alp.
permet de découvrir des activités, euh, s'amuser et puis rencontrer d'autres étudiants. On s'intègre à Grenoble INP, euh, on fait la connaissance avec des gens de, des autres écoles et, euh, et voilà, c'est sympa. Partager un petit peu, de voir les assets et tout. Et il y a encore des activités qui sont prévues, donc je pense que ça peut être euh, sympa aussi, ça va être euh, festif. Beau, il y a beaucoup d'ambiance sur Grenoble, très très étudiant. Ça fait plaisir euh, qu'il y ait du monde qui organise tout ça. Et... Ah, le campus est super beau ici et avec l'événement, c'est encore meilleur. Il apporte du, du bonheur. Quand on est là, on est, on est heureux. Il est très joli. J'adore ce campus. Il est magnifique. On découvre plein de choses. On découvre des ateliers. On a découvert l'escalade. Là, on découvre l'art. Faire du sport, s'amuser avec les copains et trouver ce qu'on va faire comme activité extrascolaire. Une belle journée. Euh, rebondissante. Excellent. C'est super plaisant. Super. Bah, original, euh, voilà. Original. Festif. Ja, hier ist es super cool. Der Campus ist geil. Die Leute ist geil. Die Stimmung ist geil. Einfach fett. Stupendo. Adesso dobbiamo vivere questi giorni qua nel miglior dei modi. Però i primi giorni sono strepitosi. Per adesso. I would say exciting. Ja. Nein, ich hoffe es. Wo ich rein habe. Ja, All I wanna do is just say. You don't understand how I play. Bienvenue so here we are again. Welcome back to our second round table. We're going to be looking at two specific subjects. So doing a thesis in a company and doing an international thesis uh, that is co-supervised, notably. So let me introduce you the speakers for this new round table. So we have to my right, uh, Judith Peters. Hello. Hello, Clara. Thank you for being with us. Your deputy director of the uh, the school in charge of international relations, yes, and I'm a professor of physics here at the UGA in Grenoble. And just next to you, we have uh, Romain Cunel, you're a doctor, you've, you've got your, uh, you finished your PhD in, in July of 2022, and you're doing your thesis that is co-supervised at the, the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Yes, it's a great international experience. We also have with us Anna Uma Lofa. Hello. You're an officer at Idam University, at Hesam University. Yes, I'm a student of geography and urban planning. And if everything is okay, we also have Pascal Gia with us. Hello, Pascal Gia. Can you hear us? 
Yes, Pascal, I can hear you very well. Thank you for welcoming me. So you're a project manager, sorry, a department manager in charge of the uh, industrial research agreements at the ANP, the, at the ANRT, so the National Association for Research and Technology. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And in this round table, we're going to add to what we've already said. We're going to go into things a bit deeper. We've talked about what a PhD degree is, how do you find your subject, what about financing? Uh, it's obvious that you have to have financing, but when you do a PhD degree in a company, notably with the research agreement model, you can have both. You've got your subject, and at the same time, you've got financing, and all of this means that you've got a foot in a company at the same time, and this means that uh, there are, there's a possibility of being taken on by the company afterwards. And this is the case of 85% of students who do this, their thesis this way. So we're going to start with Pascal. Pascal, can you tell us in a few words what uh, a research agreement thesis or a CIFRA um, thesis is? And what is the National Association for Research and Technology that you belong to? Thank you very much. So the National Association for Research and Technology is a, a private law association. It's been around since 1953. Its vocation is to create links and synergy between public research and private research. So that's the activity. Of, so the members are companies, other associations, universities, research organizations, and labs. So that's the main activity of the ANRT. And among the activities, we, are in, we have to manage this financing system reporting to the Ministry of Education. So this financing uh, instrument, which is called the CIFRA, so it's an in industrial research agreement so it's a contract between the state via the INRT because we are commissioned by the state to do this and an employer that employer may be an SME a big group a, a local authority a town hall a department a council a regional council or an association some kind of sports federation or even a, a consulate I think he said so, in exchange for the employment of a PhD student who is employed by the company, a research project is set up in partnership with an academic lab. So, the supervisor is the academic uh, supervisor of the student. So, it's a triptych between an employer, a student, and an academic lab. And then you have the doctoral school. Doctoral school provides a guarantee that the doctoral training will be carried out properly. It is a PhD degree. It has to lead to a degree, to a diploma, and this will allow PhD students after three years, or a little bit more, to obtain the thesis that we talked about so much in the previous round table. Anna, you also promote this initiative, but you focus especially on local authorities. Perhaps you can explain to us what the mission of 1,000 PhD students is. Yes, I can. Now, we support uh, project promoters, uh, whether we're talking about students or local authorities or public actors, more generally speaking, so associations, but also intermunicipal organizations, uh, county organizations, metropolitan authorities, any public stakeholder that wants to set up a CIFRA um, thesis. Normally, this was for fundamental science or hard science in companies, which is what you understand by an industrial research agreement. But it, the initiative is opened up to local authorities and uh, other social organizations. Uh, so that has been the case for the last 20 years. So it's an initiative that allows the research to be integrated into the world of public action in 
to the world of local authorities. We have 250 theses in social and human sciences every year. Um, part of these come via us because we help with the setup of the project. It takes quite a long time because if you want to set up this kind of project, it takes between six months and one year. So you, this is something that has to be taken into account if you want to do this kind of industrial research uh, thesis or if you uh, from following on from your master's or when you're coming from employment already. So we're financed by the Ministry for Higher Education, so it's a public program where we're open nationally, and we support all those with the project. This is the information that you will get if you contact us, if you're interested in public stakeholders and buy this uh, industrial research uh, PhD, because it's about acclimatizing, there are a whole range of different actors, different stakeholders, the local authority world, uh, but also embedded research and action research worlds. You're talking about the opening up of this kind of initiative. There are many international students with us today. When you're a foreign student in France, is it possible to do this kind of uh, PhD with a French cabinet? Yes, of course. The eligibility conditions for doing this industrial research PhD is that you have to have a master's. There's no uh, limit in terms of age or nationality, but the this kind of PhD uh, be done in France, or at least most of the time in France, and in a company which has its headquarters in France and pays its taxes in France, because it's about getting research in France uh, moving. So it's you can't do this kind of thesis on a subject that has to look, uh, that whose research field is abroad. So you have to do your research and development thesis in France. So, I let's say I'm doing my master's. How long ahead of time do I need to start to set up things if I want to do a PhD and if I want to get the agreement signed between me, the company, and the university school. Well, you, the earlier the better because you need to do some reading, you need to find the right people concerned uh, for social and human sciences. It might be an association, an NRT, a, an RT for um, re industrial research PhDs. Uh, that you need to go through for your financing. So you, there are lots of other possibilities if you want to do a PhD, of course. So the industrial research PhD is just one among others. Now, for in social and human activities, you can do it either after a master's in the structure where you did your internship. During your internship, you can already try and start to think about uh, doing an industrial research PhD. You can think about the project, but of course then the ANRT needs to validate that and it takes time. It takes between two and three months, well, two and five months, so it really depends, but it's normally about three months. Uh, so uh, industrial research PhDs, you can't start them straight away after the master's. You have to take into account that latency period, therefore. So, you know, maybe uh, get a, a, a short-term uh, contract with an employer in the meantime, or, and maybe, you know, take a step back when it comes to your operational uh, activities. This is the this is what we've seen with uh, students doing an industrial research PhD. Now, the are there are eligibility conditions. You mustn't have been working in the company for over nine months when you're applying to do your PhD. That's very important. You have to take that into account. So, for example, if you're employed in an association, you're an employee, and you've had a short you have a short term contract, and it's been more than nine months, you can't do your research PhD in that association. You need to apply before the nine-month period uh, uh, ends. So you need to find another structure otherwise. And the last question for Pascal, maybe. We're talking about the specifics of this uh, industrial research PhD. We heard about uh, motivation earlier on. What is the difference between uh, an industrial research PhD and a standard PhD in terms of time, the time you spend in a company and the time that you spend in a lab, for example, with your university colleagues. 
Well, before answering that question, let me just add some details. First of all, it's a, the state of, it's a commitment that has to be taken. Uh, and that involves a subsidy by the state uh, th that helps the company to take on the PhD student for a three-year period. So it's 42,000 in the long term uh, for the three-year period. So we're looking at a minimum of 23,000. The average for this kind of PhD is 32,000. So it's 46 for future PhD students, so it's a fairly attractive salary, very attractive salary, in fact. Then, when it comes to the specifics of this kind of PhD, it's it's a normal PhD in terms of the diploma. It's the same as any kind of PhD uh, diploma, so it's the same. Now, you you were talking, Clara, about the share of time between the lab and the company. This really depends on the subject being studied. There are subjects where you're going to spend the first year mainly in the lab, and in the second year, you will uh, offset this by spending time with your employer. And in the third year, you might uh, spend 50% of your time in one and 50% of your time in the other. So, for social and human sciences, you have to carry out operations in the field as well. So it means that you have to come out of the lab, but you also have to come out of the, the company in order to do your uh, studies in the field. So there's no rule. The average is usually half and half, you know, 48 to 52 between the, the time spent in the lab and the time spent in the company. But again, again, it really depends on the subject. Thank you very much. We've got some questions from the public, uh, and then we can uh, close with those questions. The first, what are the conditions required for accessing an industrial research PhD in an international context? Well, as already said by Anna, the industrial research PhD is open to all students with a master's or equivalent. So for if you've done your studies in France and you have a, a, an engineering degree or um, a, a business school degree, then you have the prerequisites for starting a thesis. If you did your higher education abroad, the diploma that you have, uh, your, your A-levels plus five years of study, needs to be recognized by the French state or you need to obtain some kind of equivalence. We talked about uh, an additional year that in the previous round table, an additional year of training to lead to the an equivalent diploma. So foreign students, you need to be able to produce a document that certifies your level of studies and it has to be the equivalent of a master's degree. Thank you very much for that answer. One last question, perhaps. Uh, the industrial research PhD, is it a real PhD from an academic point of view? You know, is it the same scientific contribution? Well, first of all, there's only one PhD diploma in France. So whether you have industrial research financing or some other kind of financing, it's the same diploma. You're, it's, it's a PhD from the French state. So there's no difference. Now, when it, from a practical point of view, setting up the PhD, is, it's going to be different. So, uh, the, the industrial research PhD is, is it's richer. So, you've got your tutor in the company, but you also have your thesis supervisor guiding you, training you uh, to be a, a researcher. So, there's a, this complementarity between these two supervisors. And for me, this offers a certain richness, a certain, uh, you know, extra wealth. So, did you want to, Hannah? Yes, just to finish on that, yes. It, it is a real thesis for all of the reasons given by Pascal. And on top of that, the Industrial Research PhD gives you professional skills and, and helps with professional integration because the you know, project management skills, the network that you develop uh, during your industrial research PhD are obviously things that you can put forward after your thesis to future employees. 
and that will help you to open doors for you in the world of work. So that's very interesting, and your professional skills um, are, are such that uh, these doors are open. So there are, you've got the academic world that opens for you. You're a researcher and a teacher, but also you've also got you've got your foot in in, in the company and the business world, and so you can work in the public or private sector afterwards. So thank you, Pascal and Hannah. Now I suggest that we move on to our last session to this round table, and that is uh, the international uh, PhD. And we'll talk to our last speakers. Now a PhD degree is the highest degree in France that you can have, but also anywhere in the world. And it's recognized internationally it, you know, it, it's equivalent. And whatever the country you do it in, the value is the same. So the PhD in France is a passport, an international passport. If you did it in France, or if you did it uh, and it was co-supervised, if you want to spend some time abroad during your PhD, then that really does give you an additional asset. And there are two aspects we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on co-supervision, and then we'll talk about other types of mobility possible during a PhD. If you don't, uh, you know, you don't have to go abroad. So let me turn to Judith first and foremost. Can you tell us what a co-supervised thesis is? Yes, of course with great pleasure. So a co-supervised thesis is a real international thesis. So it's a PhD with two or three supervisors. It's something that you do in at least two different countries. So this student is really uh, registered in two universities in two separate countries and they obtain two PhDs at the end of the road. So the student needs to comply with the conditions of all of both universities. So you can imagine in a world that's governed by a globalization uh, where Erasmus has become something that's almost obligatory for students uh, during your bachelor's or master's, a co-supervised thesis is almost the logical extension of that, but with a real um, added plus point. As an Erasmus student, you remain registered in your original university, whereas if it's co if it's co-supervised, you have to register in both universities. So this means spending at least one third of your time in the partner country, and that generally means that the person has to learn another language and, and master that language, but also they have to learn to um, navigate a different university. Whereas with Erasmus, you tend to stay in your country, in your university, and but here you have to be able to survive in another country and another system. And sometimes that can be a really big adventure that's not that easy to um, negotiate. But it does obviously uh, add to your CV if you're a young researcher. Now, Roma, perhaps you can tell us about your experience. You did a co-supervised a PhD between the University of Grenoble Alp and the Vancouver University in Canada. And that's, so you did a co-supervised thesis. Explain to us how you found that and, and how it went. Well, thank you for that question. So um, I'm basically going to reflect what Judith says. It's a great adventure, and that's that's speaking euphemistically. Now, I did most of my internships with the same professor, so I, was, I, I knew him very well, and I developed a research theme right uh, at the end of my bachelor's. And at the end of my master's, I had the opportunity to go and do half of my internship in um, a Canadian laboratory where I did my co-supervised thesis later. It's a lab that the research director was familiar with, and the research themes of the lab were similar to what I was doing. Um, we worked in the similar molecules. I did uh, my 
thesis in chemistry at the end of my master's, therefore, I spent four months on either side of the Atlantic, and we realized, and myself and my two supervisors, my two internship supervisors, they realized that my research was beneficial for everybody because it meant that I could develop adaptability skills. I, I, I was, had been exposed to the, the foreign system and not just the French system. Um, that's, uh, it was an advantage for the labs because they could uh, further their partnerships. And also it meant that there was a new uh, look, uh, somebody from outside with a new look at what they were doing. So I did these internships. Then I decided to do the co-supervised thesis. And I was lucky because I was I did the chemistry and life sciences UGA uh, competition, the entrance exam. I, I passed the exam. And so I had financing for doing my thesis in France and abroad. So I had that salary was already there. And on top of that, I had financing in Canada. So things were fairly stable from a financial point of view for me. And so to come back to what was said about the industrial research PhDs, it does take quite a bit of time um, when you're doing something and it's co-supervised. So even if we kind of prepared well ahead of time, right from the end of my master's, we wanted this uh, co-supervision experience, it took between six to seven months to get everything set up uh, to draft the co-supervision agreement, for example. And we'll talk about, uh, Judy can talk about that in more detail. So it's a document uh, where both universities come to an agreement and the PhD students about the conditions for the student to register, uh, for the student to defend their thesis and, and have the thesis validated in both universities. So it was the administrative part that was quite long. It took uh, seven to eight months. So I spent you know, a year and a bit in France before I went to Canada for 16 months and then I came back to France to do the last part of my thesis where I drafted my thesis, I defended my thesis in France and in English uh, because I was in uh, the English speaking part of Canada. So great, so that was brief, nice and short. So Judith, Signing the agreement, what are the parameters that have to be taken into account? So we've understood that we only defend our thesis once. So, you know, what are the conditions? How, 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 do, how, how does it all happen? Uh, that's a very good question. So the agreement, the thesis agreement, is something that's very important because it's a, basically a contract that uh, sets out the conditions according to which the thesis will be carried out. So to begin with, uh, the durations are defined. You know, how long will the student spend in one country and the other country? What about the drafting of the manuscript? What language will it be drafted in? What country will the thesis be defended in and in what language? So everything is defined beforehand. And that's kind of a protection for the PhD students, if you like, because it kind of solves all of the critical points and unless there's an exception, nothing else is changed. So we know right from the start what we uh, should expect. So during the first uh, year of the PhD, it's the PhD student and supervisor who go and see the, the doctoral college, and the doctoral college already has the forms, the standard forms for this kind of co-supervised agreement. So they have to fill in the most important points, but there are other things that cannot be negotiated. So only one manuscript, one thesis, one written thesis, one um, the thesis is divided only once. And once the doctoral college has obtained all of the information, it's up to us to draft or to help the student to draft the agreement and then to put put it forward to the partners and and you know we usually agree quite quickly and then you know you so you have to get over all of these administrative difficulties and then Romain can you tell us how you experienced the thesis between the two countries? So there was the language, and, and apparently you are good at English, but you discovered new ways of working. You had to maybe make some kind of a cultural adjustment uh, 
Is communication might have been different. Is there anything that you can pay testimony to today? Well, yes, I think that what we could say, if you're doing a co-supervised thesis, and, and it's not just Erasmus or international mobility programs, it's, it's a bit different from those. If you're doing a co-supervised uh, thesis, you, you are in, submerged in a different culture, a different language. So the working culture is different. In France, our thesis system is such that we have a teacher in charge of two or three PhD students with different types of financing. In Canada and in different Anglo-Saxon countries, you only have one research director who has lots of different students. And so it was really quite different in Canada. We're much more left to our own devices. Uh, we, we are in charge of our own research, our own problems. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it really is it's good training for life. So the, the working modes are different in both countries. So, but it's also true culturally. In France, for example, you know, we take time at lunchtime, we talk to colleagues, we talk about our research. That's not the case in Canada. Lunchtime was a lot shorter. People are concentrated on their own research at lunchtime. And that's why I was lucky to be able to go to Canada beforehand, because I had already been through that experience. But it meant as well that I, you know, it meant that I could really plunge down deep into this country. It meant that I could focus on my adaptability skills. It meant that, you know, as well as being a PhD student, um, you know, I had to adapt. And this adds additional skills. It's something um, that um, you can promote when you meet up with a, a potential employer. So different working universes. What about the points of view of the different supervisors? Because they might diverge. Was this your case? And, and did you have to solve? And how did you solve this? If so, well, I was lucky again. Our research themes were really quite similar, and so we had a common interest uh, to explore the same paths and, and not to not 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 to squabble. And and you know it went very well, and, and I was very lucky in that way. But I think generally speaking, when you're doing a thesis, you have to be on the same wavelength. You know, the the PhD student has to be on the same wavelength as the teacher, um, researcher, and vice versa. And for an industrial research PhD, this is important too. In my case, I didn't have too many problems. I think that what's important above all is that everybody agrees right from the start of the coach supervision. I think this is what makes a, a co-supervised thesis uh, successful. You've got to share common interests. This is really what determines the viability of this kind of experience. Everybody has to be on the same wavelength. Everybody has to pull in the same direction and, and share the same kind of communication. You have to basically want the same thing in the long term. Thank you very much, Romain. Perhaps to finish this part, uh, focusing on international PhDs, so a co-supervised thesis is, 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 is the best way of having it, and the best kind of international experience. But there are other possibilities for mobility, um, for international mobility. If you're not doing a co-supervised thesis because it's just not done in, in your field or it just wasn't possible, and sometimes it, it involves a, a big commitment, six month, 16 months abroad, sometimes uh, students don't want to get, move away from France so long. So, in the university here, there's the possibility to travel differently. I'm doing my thesis in the University of Grenoble Alp with a single supervisor, and yet there is a partner in the United States, so the University of San Antonio in Texas, working on the same subject 
subjectively, same kind of subjectively, and the university has offered, uh, has asked, uh, invited me to go and stay for three months, and that will be uh, part of my thesis. Uh, and my thesis is based on articles. Some theses are just one single draft, other theses are based on different articles, and I'm going to be able to do an article. Um, in the United States, uh, and, and so I'll be able to finance uh, my transport, my accommodation, there are mobility grants, so I can uh, leave for three months, therefore, and go to the United States and, and, and have that international experience, which I wouldn't have had otherwise if I had decided to do my thesis just in France uh, without applying for that kind of international mobility program. In the few minutes remaining, let's have a look at what the questions are from the public. Here they are on the screen. So, there's the first question, how long does it take to do an industrial research PhD? This takes us back to the first round table. So, I'm in Sweden, says the student, I'm, I'm doing a PhD, and a PhD takes five years, not three in Sweden. So, what about an industrial research PhD? Anna, well, like any PhD, it's three years, but uh, an industrial research PhD uh, has a, a state subsidy. So there's a contract uh, between the organization and the state, so, and it's a work contract. You are a, a salaried employee of the host structure. That's very important. So you have the same rights as a normal employee. How long does an industrial research PhD, PhD take? Well, it's three years. Three years. Now, in the concretely, an industrial research PhD, even if it's three years that are subsidized, it's more like four or five. Thank you very much for that answer. So now let's talk about it. International PhDs, there's a question who says, I've already done my first uh, PhD year in my university. Would I have to redo that PhD for if I wanted to switch to a co supervised thesis? So it's somebody who would, would like to switch to a co supervised thesis and they've already started their thesis. Is that, proper, is that possible? Would they have to redo their first year? Well, that's not the idea that we have for a co supervised thesis. It's not. Uh, the idea is to really start your co-supervised thesis in your first year, during your first year, or right at the start of your second year. If it's too late and registration is refused, well, there are other possibilities. For example, we have EDEX financing, EGAP financing for mobility between one and and six months of mobility. There are uh, grants as well for foreign students, FN grants, for example, that can finance it up to one year of study in France. So, quite frankly, I would advise to re the student to redo a year. What what a waste! You know, it's always a waste repeating something. So. Try and see how you can catch up for lost time. Are you allowed to register even uh, for your second year, maybe? Or maybe there is other financing that you can apply for, for a longer stay abroad in France or elsewhere. It's better than, you know, wanting to redo your first year. Yes, um, I think that's a, a good thing to say. There are lots of different possibilities. So the UGA has possibilities. We try and get students to go abroad as much as possible, especially PhD students, but really find out about what is possible. If you've already started your PhD and it's not a co-supervised PhD, maybe there is the possibility of benefiting from the international uh, program rather than starting from scratch, which would be a shame if you've already started. If I may, um, there are quite a lot of questions about the duration for an industrial research PhD or a normal PhD. But if you take the French model and for co-supervised PhDs, the duration is really three years. This is the case for most PhDs in France. 
So then there are addenda that can be drawn up for post supervised thesis. This was my case. So that, that, that takes us beyond three years. Now, for me, this was the case, but then there was COVID, so the financing was extended uh, because of COVID. But the basic contract is a three-year contract for financing, but then you can extend, you can take a bit more time to finalize the drafting of your thesis and then defend that thesis, but normally it's three years. Okay, thank you very much, Omar, for adding that information. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much to our guests, uh, Judith, Roma, Hannah, and Pascal, who was with us remotely. Thank you to all of you online, all of you students online, uh, you were here to find out more about uh, the PhD, to ask your questions. Please feel free to ask uh, questions and send them to the doctoral school at the University of Grenoble Alps. They will be very happy to answer your questions. The address is given in the chat. But of course, please don't leave because we're going to start our third session now. So now you can find out more about the 13 doctoral schools listed on your screen. Now, normally you've registered for one of these. So can I invite you to join the doctoral school that uh, you want to go to? If you have any problems joining your room, don't worry. The organizational team will help you and will guide you towards the right room. Thank you again. Hopefully we'll see you soon here at the University of Grenoble Alp for your PhD.